Oral questions. Questions oral. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, last week the Prime Minister implied that major construction projects bring negative consequences because they bring large numbers of men into communities. Now, this is an insult to Canada's blue collar workers, especially in the energy sector, who are reeling from thousands of job losses under the Liberals. So, can the Prime Minister tell us if he asked for a gender based analysis on his decisions to kill the Northern Gateway and Energy East pipelines? And does he ask for gender based analysis on oil imported from Saudi Arabia and the impact that that has on women? And girls and yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are proud of the work we've done to support our workers across this country and indeed get big projects built. The LNG Canada Terminal in British Columbia is the largest private sector investment in Canadian history. The Nova Gas Pipeline, Line 3 Replacement Project, the Arnold Appetite Mine, Wood Fibre LNG, the Ridley Island Propane Terminal. And I suggest, Mr. Speaker, that the fact that the Conservatives don't understand that there is dif are differences in how policies get brought in, uh, depending on gender, uh, it underlines why it's so important to do that analysis in the first place. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, the results from his policies are the same for both men and women. Thousands and thousands of people out of work. Yeah. That's his legacy. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Natural Resources Minister claimed that intelligent people know that the courts killed Northern Gateway. But in 2014, the Prime Minister tweeted, if I'm elected Prime Minister, the Northern Gateway pipeline will not become a reality. Wow. And then on November 29, 2016, he proclaimed, we are also announcing that the Government of Canada has directed the National Energy Board to dismiss the application for the Northern Gateway pipeline project. When will the Prime Minister take responsibility for his own actions in this Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite should get his facts straight. We've created over 600,000 new jobs over the past three years to go with a record low unemployment and the fastest growth rate in the G7 last year. We're going to continue to work hard to grow the economy and support Canadians right across the country. We recognize, however, uh, that Alberta is suffering. There is a massive price differential that is causing uh, significant impacts on them. We continue to work with the industry. I was pleased to be out there a couple of weeks ago to talk with them, to hear their proposals on solutions, and to commit to working with them to help Alberta, because all Canadians care that Albertans do well. Yeah. The Honourable Order. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is very simple. The Prime Minister has an opportunity to clear the air. His minister responsible for natural resources claims that it wasn't their fault no, that the Northern Gary. Gateway pipeline got cancelled. Yet here we see the Prime Minister's own quote saying that we are also announcing that the Government of Canada has directed the National Energy Board to dismiss the application for the Northern Gateway Pipelines project. Will the Prime Minister reinstate that application, yes or no? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on Northern Gateway, the Federal Court of Appeal was very clear that the previous government failed to get the review process for Northern Gateway right, so the court squashed the project's approval. To quote the Federal Court of Appeal, the inadequacies, more than just a handful and more than mere imperfections, left entire subjects of central interest to the affected First Nations, sometimes subjects affecting their subsistence and well-being, entirely ignored. Those, Mr. Speaker, are the facts. We will take no lessons from the party that was unable for 10 years to get resources to non-U.S. markets. Order. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Order. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister sounds like he was just reading from the judge's decision on his failed consultations for the Trans Mountain application. But here's the thing. The court ruled in Trans Mountain that there were major deficiencies for those hearings. So what did the Prime Minister do? He announced that he was going to restart them and do it again. Now, here we have a situation where there is real hurt going on in the province of Alberta with thousands of people out of work. We need to get our products to new markets. Northern Gateway will do that. Will he throw a lifeline to the Northern Gateway yeah, project and get it back on the books, or does he not believe in it? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, this is a perfect example of the members opposite playing politics, being filled with bluster and support for Alberta that actually won't help. Uh, if we were to start uh, right now on Northern Gateway, even if it were acceptable, it would be years before that happened. Before that, we've got the Line 3 coming in uh, next year. We've got uh, the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline moving forward in the right way, which is what they were unable to get done uh, over 10 years. They did nothing to get resources to new markets, and that's why the oil patch is hurting today. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have admitted that non-binding agreements like the Global Compact on Migration can become customary international law and inform the interpretation of domestic law. This compact also contains language around sensitizing and educating journalists on how they should report about immigration. Canadians want their government, not foreign entities, to be in control of our immigration system, a system that is orderly, compassionate and fair. Will the Prime Minister assure Canadians that he will not sign on to the United Nations Global Compact on Migration? Prime Minister. It's interesting, Mr. Speaker, in a, a question about sensitizing journalists, he's quoting rebel media talking points. Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to stand up for immigration, knowing that defending diversity is a source of strength and welcoming people through a rigorous immigration system from around the world is what has made Canada strong and indeed something the world needs more of, not less of, like they want to bring in. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejet, Temiskwata, Les Basques. Mr. Speaker, the report tabled yesterday on the India trip doesn't answer our questions about the disastrous trip. People were expecting answers to questions like what was someone like Atwal doing at the residence of the Canadian High Commission in India, or was there any foreign interference? Instead, the committee's findings were censored by the Prime Minister's office. Is PMO confusing liberal security with national security? Are liberal interests being mixed up with the national interest? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I understand that the NDP is uh, ganging up with the Conservatives on this, but the fact is neither myself nor my office demanded or called for any censoring of the report. A proposal, a proposal was made by an official and that was accepted. No addition, no removals. Now a member for Rimouski Nejet Temiskwata Les Basques. In 2015, the Liberals promised open and transparent government. When it comes to the Prime Minister's trip to India, one thing is clear. It was a total failure when it comes to transparency. In addition to being under investigation by the RCMP, the member for Brampton East is being investigated by the Ethics Commissioner for his participation on this trip. He invited a business partner who got exclusive access to the Prime Minister and other Cabinet colleagues. The trip was doubly embarrassing to both him and his government. Is that why the Prime Minister's office heavily censored the report's findings? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, let me repeat for the member opposite what I said. There was no, censor no censorship decision made by the Prime Minister's office. A recommendation was made by an official, a security and intelligence official, and that proposal was accepted. There was no censorship initiated by the Prime Minister's office. James Bay. Speaker, the security report on the Prime Minister's National Lampoon vacation to India is out. We find out the Prime Minister actually has the power to redact the documents, including the questions of foreign interference. I mean, what's with that? Questions of foreign interference cuts to the very heart of democratic accountability. Donald Trump would love to have the power to black out investigations into foreign interference into his political hijinks. It was the Prime Minister's decision to put the interests of the Liberal Party ahead of the interests of Canada that caused this debacle. Why is this Prime Minister continuing to put the petty interests of the Liberal Party ahead of the interests of protecting the people of Canada? Here, here. Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, we see the member opposite refuses to let facts and direct answers get in the way of sanctimonious rhetoric. Let me repeat for the member opposite. Neither I nor my office requested or directed any redactions. A proposal was made by our professionals in the security and intelligence community, and it was accepted. We did no extra redacting. We did no under redacting. We accepted the advice of the professionals.
Honourable Member for Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, parliamentary privilege is a powerful tool that's afforded to all members of Parliament so that we can do our jobs. But the Liberal Member from Brampton East used his privilege to ask senior law enforcement officials troubling questions about money laundering. After the Prime Minister told us that he was quitting, that MP reversed his decision, maintaining his parliamentary privilege, which protects him from being subpoenaed to the House of Commons and also protects him being forced to testify in court against someone who say accused of money laundering. Is this the Prime Minister actually okay with this scenario? And if he's not, what is he going to do about yes. it? Well, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago, the member stated his intentions after informing us of the challenges he is facing. He is no longer a member of the Liberal caucus. We respect the independence of the RCMP and the important work they do. We highlight uh, that being in this House is no protection from criminal prosecutions, as we all found out when Dean Del Mastro was led away in shackles. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, numerous media reports have tied the Minister of Innovation to allegations of questionable real estate deals in Brampton. Another. These reports also involve the Liberal member for Brampton East, Liberal Party donors, a former Liberal Party riding president, and of course the Prime Minister's disastrous trip to India. Can the Prime Minister tell us if his innovation minister has been questioned by the RCMP in relation to these reported allegations, yes or no? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, following up on the question the NDP member asked about parliamentary privilege, let me make something clear for people at home. In this House of Commons, members are protected by parliamentary privilege, which also per per permits them to make baseless accusations. The best way to find out if what the member opposite is saying is true is to see whether he's willing to repeat those insinuations outside the House. I invite my colleague to do so. Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to repeat what I've just said in the House of Commons outside because these allegations are the subject of media reports, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. They've already been printed. The question was very simple. The question is, of course, the minister has the benefit of the doubt under Canadian law on this. The question was whether or not the minister is being investigated. So has the Minister for Innovation been investigated, uh, been questioned by the RCMP, yes or no? The RCMP works independently of government. The government of the day does not um, direct investigations. This government will not undermine our security officials. We respect the work that they do. We know that the Conservatives might have chosen a new leader. What's clear is that their approach to undermining our security officials remains the case today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, if the Liberals think that their little threats and bullying is, or is that's going to make us shut up on this side of the House, they're quite wrong. Yesterday, the Minister of Innovation refused to answer simple questions about an article in the National Post. The story revealed a shady transaction in Brampton. The city even made an official complaint to the RCMP. So I ask my question again today. Can the Minister of Immigration tell us how he's connected to that company? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday and on other days, any allusion to the Minister committing any wrongdoing is false. And if the member repeats it outside the House, he will be hearing from the Minister's lawyer. The member made comments yesterday and he changed the words he used outside the House as compared to what he said in the House. I invite him to say exactly what he said in the House, outside the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have to hear the answers and the questions. And other members do too. Order. The Mountain Member for Wellington Halton Hills will please come to order. Allah. Order.
thought you were going to behave yourself. And I have to take that rest my The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, the member can speak louder and shout and threaten, but our knees are not shaking right now. We are going to stand firm on this side of the House. If the minister won't answer about his connection to that company, can he tell us why execs from that company took part in the Prime Minister's India trip and why the minister took a picture with one exec, a former Liberal Riding Association president, and why several execs had made donations to the Liberal Party. All those facts uh, are legit. Can the minister tell us whether he's been contacted by the Mounties, and if so, when? The Honourable House Leader. If the member would like me to speak more slowly, I can do that. And the member knows full well that the Mounties work independently at arm's length from government, and uh, that's all there is to it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A confidential report sent to a Liberal MP and a Liberal minister, a $1.1 million windfall for a Liberal Party insider on a real estate flip, who subsequently was a guest of the Prime Minister on an India trip, a forensic investigation ordered by a City Council with the result that Council sends the report to the RCMP. Now, since the Minister has been mentioned in this fact situation, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to know from the Minister, has he been interviewed by the RCMP yet? Yes, yes or no? Or no? Well, government House Leader. have never let facts get into the way of what they say in this place. That member should very well know that when it comes to the RCMP, they work independently of government. The government does not direct the, in, uh, the RCMP. This government respects the work of our security officials. We will not undermine their work like the Conser Conservatives clearly yeah. continue to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Milton. I don't think that was the answer that she meant to give, Mr. Speaker. Usually she threatens us with legal action outside the House. And if that is the case, I'll be more than happy to accept service at my constituency office when we talk about this later today. Mr. Speaker, the question for the minister is not to the RCMP, and it's not questioning the RCMP's duties or their investigation. It's to the minister, and it's this House leader who's preventing the minister from standing up and answering his own question, which is, have you been questioned by the RCMP? Yes or no? The Honourable Member for Milton knows that when we say you in the House of General he refers to the chair. I don't think she met the chair, pretty sure. So, they want me to answer it. <laughs> order, order, order. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, even you would know that the RCMP works independently of the government, and this government respects the words of our security officials. The minister has responded to these questions directly in this place. The minister has put himself on the record. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I have no problem reminding people when they are taking advantage of the privilege of this place. Members opposite choose to make accusations in this place, but they do not outside this place, which is absolutely fascinating. We respect the work of the RCMP, and we think they should do their important work. The Honourable Member for jean -Pierre. Mr. Speaker, our dairy farmers are sick and tired of being used as bargaining chips for trade deals. The Liberals are in such a rush to finish what the Conservatives started, they've turned their backs on dairy farmers for the third time in as many years. And they granted the U.S. oversight over our supply management system. It's unacceptable. And farmers are right to have lost faith in the Liberals. Can the Minister tell us when exactly his government is going to fully compensate farmers for all three deals? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think my honourable colleague is well aware that we're the party that fought to implement supply management, and we're the party that's going to defend supply management. It's important to note during the, the NAFTA negotiations, the American government intended to destroy the supply management system, and we made sure that did not happen. We understand that there are impacts on our farmers, and we are committed to fully and fairly supporting them and to make sure they continue to succeed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Essex. 
Canada's ambassador to the U.S. told an audience yesterday in Ottawa that in 12 months from now, there's a 90 percent chance U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum will be gone. He said tariffs are hurting U.S. businesses. You know who is 100 percent hurting right now? Canadian workers and small businesses. This deal should never have been signed without removing the tariffs in the first place. No one understands why the Liberals are choosing to wait for communities and families in Canada to suffer and gave up our best shot at removing them. Canadians want to know now what is the plan to remove them. Mr. Speaker, Canada has always been clear with the United States that the 232 tariffs are completely unacceptable. It is not a national security consideration, and we've challenged it not only here in public, but the Prime Minister has done so with the President at every available opportunity. It is overwhelmingly in the best interest of both Canada and the United States to stop this unfair and unjust practice. In the meantime, our strong, responsive measures of up to $2 billion will help and defend our workers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, a member for Charlebourg, Haut Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, the highly anticipated report of the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians was released yesterday, but not before the Prime Minister's office had a look at it. On October 12th, once censored, the report confirms yet again that the Prime Minister's bungling was somebody else's fault. The Prime Minister produced some nice photo ops in traditional dress, but kept his guest list secret. Why hasn't he released the full guest list for that trip? The government house leader. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister did not ask for any censorship or redaction to the report. He accepted what was reported by uh, the recommendations of public uh, safety and intelligence officials who recommended that certain information be removed that could compromise national security and international relations. In the preface to the report, it says, pursuant to the relevant legislation on the NSICOP uh, committee, the report was revised to remove potentially harmful information to international relations and public safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, saint -Charles. In the same report, it says that the Prime Minister received the report on October 12th and a couple of weeks before it was released. And before there was censoring, uh, nobody got access to that information. And we, But we do know one person who was on the trip, Bagwan Gruwal, a Gorway Heaven exec and former Liberal Writing Association president. Gorway Heaven is the same company that flipped a piece of land in Brampton for a tidy profit. The city of Brampton reported that that transaction to the RCMP because the Minister of Innovation was made privy to confidential information about the value of the land. The question is simple. Who invited this individual? The Honourable Government House Leader, Mr. Speaker, as we, we received an unclassified version of the NCCOP report since it's been tabled in Parliament. We thank the committee for its hard work and we will study its recommendations carefully. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister blamed the member for Surrey Centre for inviting a convicted terrorist on the PM's disastrous India trip. But one of the few lightly asterisk redacted chapters in the committee report shows it was the PMO that put Jaspal Atwal on the guest oh, list. Oh. As an RCMP officer belatedly observed, a Google search would have identified the risk if the guest list had been provided to security. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister now accept responsibility for this security breakdown? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as the member knows, uh, the member he's referred to has apologized for his role in these events and he has committed to exercising better judgment. The Prime Minister did not request or direct any redactions. The Prime Minister accepted the redactions proposed by security officials. Security officials recommended the removal of information that could be injurious to national security or international relations if disclosed. If the member opposite has any questions about the process of the committee, perhaps he can uh, consult with the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka, who the Conservative leader chose as their representative. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Thornhill. Well, Mr. Speaker, page three of this first report of the new committee lays bare a process that allows 
the Prime Minister to censor the report not only for national security, but to prevent his embarrassment under the guise yep. of international relations. Okay. The report was supposed to address the clumsy use of intelligence to excuse how a terrorist got on the PM's trip that sparked a diplomatic incident with India. Instead, the committee's six findings on supposed foreign interference are completely redacted. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister get off his asterisks and release the findings? <laughs> Mr. Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, uh, the recommendations from the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians will obviously be very carefully reviewed uh, to improve operations. While members of the committee cannot divulge classified material, they represent all official political parties in the House of Commons and all sides in the Senate, and they most certainly can complain if they believe any redactions go too far. Those redactions were made on the basis of the professional advice of independent security agencies. That is one of the very good reasons for having a committee of parliamentarians, just like all of our Five Eyes ally. The Honourable Member. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Under the Liberals, the auto industry has become a branch plant economy with foreign interests controlling our workers' fate. Look at Australia. With no plan or policy, their auto industry shed tens of thousands of jobs and now has only one Australian working left, the current GM President of Canada, Mr. Hester, who declared Oshawa a done deal. Yeah. A not-so-fun fact, Mr. Hester resides in the U.S., and with the GM firings, Canada took a much higher percentage of job loss than the U.S. itself. Will the minister call an emergency meeting with Oshawa stakeholders and find a solution, or do they have to shoulder this burden alone? Yes. Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear that GM has made a big mistake by turning its back on the workers in Oshawa. We will not make that same mistake. That is why we've engaged with the province. We're directly dealing with them and my provincial counterpart. That's why I've reached out and spoken with the municipal leadership as well. We'll continue to support this automotive sector going forward. And since 2015, Mr. Speaker, we've seen $5.6 billion worth of investments in the automotive sector. 3,000 jobs have been created during our tenure in the automotive sector. 30,000 jobs were lost in the first few years of the Conservative government when they were in power, Mr. Speaker. That's our record. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For a few years now, the TSB has been sounding the alarm on the dangers of operator fatigue in the rail sector. On the one hand, the minister says over and over that safety is his highest priority, but on the other, he lets the industry regulate itself. The result? Nothing has changed. Furthermore, the transportation of crude oil by rail has doubled since the Lake Lac Mégantic tragedy, which is of no comfort whatsoever. Mr. Speaker, does the minister intend on regulating on the issue of fatigue, or will he stick to the same old refrain? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, rail safety is my highest priority. And since, two, this is the fall of 2002-17, I have been saying that we will be reviewing the rules on hours of work for train operators. We know that this is important factor that affects the safety of our trains, and it is something that we have committed to doing and that I announced in the fall of 2017. James Assiniboia Headingley. Mr. Speaker, our government announced a few weeks ago a $117 million investment to the Arctic Shipping Group, a historic private-public partnership that blends First Nations, community ownership, and Canadian private sector leadership. With this innovative group now operating the line, the crucial rail link between the town of Churchill and the rest of the country was restored, and the northern Manitobans now see the results of those e efforts. Could the Honourable Mim Minister of Transport share this good news with my constituents and the people of Manitoba? Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I, I would like to thank the member from Charleswood St. James, Assiniboia Headingley, for his excellent question and for his strong adv advocacy yes. on behalf of Manitoba. Yes. It is with great pleasure that I announce that Via Rail service to Churchill has now been restored and that the first train since the washout arrived at Churchill Station today. We said we were committed, Mr. Speaker, to restoring Via Rail to the Hudson's Bay Rail Line. Promise made, promise kept. Honourable member for 
Central Okanagan, the milk mean order. Mr. Speaker, we have order. a looming order. jobs crisis in Canada, and the. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Sir Milkamine Nicola. Mr. Speaker, we have a looming jobs crisis here in Canada, and the Liberals don't seem to care. Instead, this Prime Minister would rather spend his time giving out millions of dollars via tweets and or threatening lawsuits if opposition members ask questions he doesn't like. Now, the energy sector is in crisis mode. The auto sector is reeling, and there's no end in sight for steel and aluminum tariffs, and softwood lumber producers feel forgotten. When will the Prime Minister realize that his economic policies have failed Canadians, Mr. Hey, Speaker? Hey, Minister of Innovation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let's highlight some key facts. Since 2015, 500,000 jobs, full-time jobs, have been created in the Canadian economy. We have the lowest unemployment rate in the last 40 years. And through our direct programming, the Strategic Innovation Fund, which is part of our government's plan, we've seen jobs created in the Canadian economy. Let me highlight a few examples. CAE, 4,300 jobs. Lord. Rio Tinto and Alcoa, 11,500 jobs. Lord. Encore, 4,000 jobs. Lord. Linamar, 9,500 jobs. Lord. Maple Leaf Foods, 1,600 jobs. Lord. Wildwood Meadow, 417 jobs. Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's no value in creating jobs if the next day even more are lost. Yeah. Canada has reached a tipping point with severe job losses in oil, auto and aerospace. No sector is safe. While crippling steel and aluminum tariffs remain, the Liberals have signed a deal that leaves Canada vulnerable to even more national security tariffs. We know the Trump administration is now looking at tariffs on uranium, a $2 billion industry in Canada. Is that next? When will the government get serious and understand that national security and the economy go hand in hand, protect our jobs, and stand up for Canadians' best interests? Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the automotive sector because that's very timely, and the member opposite has raised that issue. When the Conservatives were in power, before we hit the economic recession in 2008 and 2009, we saw 30,000 jobs lost during their tenure in the automotive sector. During the first three years of our track record, because of our programs and policies, we created a net 6,000 new jobs in the automotive sector. That's a plan that's working because we're investing in Canadians, we're investing in companies, and we're seeing job growth numbers right across the country, Mr. Speaker. That's getting the job done. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. The reality, Mr. Speaker, is that for one month now, the whole industry in Canada has been disrupted. 2,500 jobs lost in the auto sector, 3,000 jobs lost in the aeronautics sector, and 100,000 jobs lost in the energy sector. And what is the government doing? Well, just cross, crossing its fingers on aluminum, steel, and softwood lumber. And what else is it doing? It's imposing a carbon tax. Why? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. The member opposite knows full well that many industries support our price on pollution, including the automotive sector, including the aerospace sector. Let me talk about job creation numbers, Mr. Speaker. Nova Chemicals, this is a very important company in Alberta, 2,200 jobs. Rio Tinto and Alcoa, 11,500 jobs. The aerospace sector, CAE, 4,300 jobs. Toyota, Mr. Speaker, 5,000 jobs. And this is a reflection of direct policies and programs because of our government, and we'll continue to make sure we create more jobs in the Canadian economy. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, I would ask the Minister go, to go outside and repeat that to the weakers who have lost their jobs. The interesting thing is that the Minister is the one rising. Well, seeing as he's willing to rise, can he say yes or no He met with the, whether he met with the RCMP? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. In French, no. The Honourable Member for saint hyacinthe bagot Mr. Speaker, Health Canada is approving medical devices such as artificial hips, insulin pumps and pacemakers that are dangerous and that other countries have banned. Moreover, last week we learned that thousands of women were experiencing health issues after having received breast implants that they thought were safe but that had been approved with no prior studies. Health Canada seems incapable of protecting the health of the public. How can the minister still rise and say that we have 
one of the best systems in the world. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, Canadians deserve to know that the metal devices are effective and health. Risks of any products are assessed before they are used. But we do know that it is possible to do better, and that's what we will be doing. We will strengthen the process, approval process. We will improve surveillance. And we will provide Canadians with more information on data and research that has been completed. Mr. Speaker, this is a situation that we take very seriously, and I'm following it closely. Sway. Mr. Speaker, Canadians don't want better, they want safety. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Health Canada is allowing high-risk medical devices to be used when they've been recalled in other countries. They're allowing implants in patients that have only been tested on cadavers and animals. Wow. And they're relying on a voluntary system of reporting problems. Mr. Speaker, insulin pumps, replacement hips, pacemakers, breast implants and others have caused more than 14,000 injuries and over 1,400 deaths in Canada. Instead of talking points and false assurances, what is this minister doing to fix this broken system? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I as well was very concerned as many Canadians when I saw the report last week that was on, on TV. None of us want to see any Canadians suffer any hardship. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that in August of this year, I was pleased to ask Health Canada to start a review of medical devices. The review is underway, and I'm pleased to say that we have an action plan that is in place. We are taking this matter extremely seriously, and I've asked my officials to make sure that it is done fast and in a way that is transparent to ensure that Canadians get all the information that they need regarding medical devices. Thank you. Honourable Member for Battleford's Lloyd Minster. Mr. Speaker. Our farmers and rural communities continue to find themselves at the losing end of this Liberal government's failed policies. The Liberals are giving large industry, industries a pass on their costly and ineffective carbon tax. But there's no exemption for our farmers. Our farmers can't pass on the cost to their business, and farmers are already doing more than their share to reduce carbon emissions. Will the Prime Minister stop unfairly punishing our farmers and abandon his carbon tax scheme? Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We campaigned on a promise to make sure that we would grow the economy and, take care at, and protect the environment at the same time, and that's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. We know that we Canadians are, are responsible stewards of the land, and that's why we have exempted farm fuel and gasoline under the federal backstop. We've also provided additional relief for greenhouse farmers for their propane. Mr. Speaker, we have and will continue to support our agricultural sector in this country. Yeah. Member for Niagara West. Mr. Speaker, steel and aluminum tariffs are hurting Canadian economy. Business owners are forced to cut orders, reduce shifts, and lay off workers. Every day these tariffs remain in place, Canadian jobs are at risk. The Prime Minister failed to get Donald Trump to drop the tariffs at his recent signing ceremony. So why will the Prime Minister resolve the trade dispute on steel and aluminum tariffs and stop the job losses in Canada? Honourable Minister, Prime Secretary for Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, we're very focused on eliminating the unjustified and illegal tariffs imposed by the United States on Canadian steel and aluminum. This is an absolute priority for our government. We've put in place strong, responsive measures to protect the workers. We've also recently signed the Auto Section 232 side letter, which is of vital importance to automobile workers because it gives Canada important protections against the threat of U.S. Automo automotive tariffs in the future. That would have hurt hundreds of thousands of workers, their jobs, and the factories that produce them. Mr. Speaker, this is a good thing. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, in my region, you don't hear people celebrating the new free trade agreement. We are a proud, innovative, and welcoming people. We produce, among others, cheese and milk and the greenest aluminum in the world. It's called a free trade agreement, Mr. Speaker. There is no reason for quotas or tariffs. The planet needs more green aluminum produced by people who care about its impact. When will the steel and aluminum tariffs be lifted? Secretary. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, a few days ago, 
we signed the Section 232 side letter on the auto sector that provides Canadians with significant protections against the threat of American tariffs uh, that my colleague just alluded to. Under the new agreement, supply chains will be secured, which are crucial in the automobile sector, and it will also improve the wages and rights of workers. This agreement is beneficial for hundreds of thousands of Canadians who work in the auto sector and for all Canadian workers, Mr. Speaker. And this is an excellent thing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last Friday was a historic day. After more than a year of hard work, Canada, the United States and Mexico have finally signed the new NAFTA. This agreement safeguards more than $2 billion a day, Mr. Speaker and cross-border trade between Canada and the United States. I know that this tariff-free access is vital for workers and businesses in my community of Niagara. Can the Permanent Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs tell this House how Canada will continue to stand up for Canadian businesses and our workers? Good question. Free Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Niagara Centre for his excellent question and for his hard work. and always will fight for Canadian workers. And as I've said several times today already, the new NAFTA preserves crucial cross-border cross -border supply change and has significantly improved wages and labour rights for Canadian workers. And last week, the Automobile Section 232 side letter was signed. This now gives Canadian new protections against the threat of U.S. automotive tariffs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Fort McMurray Gold Lake. Here we are. Mr. Speaker, talking about jobs, yesterday we learned the Liberals are planning to move the aerospace engineering test establishment from Coal Lake to Ottawa. This would severely impact the community of Coal Lake and our defence capability. Will the Minister cancel any plans he has of moving these jobs out of CFB Coal Lake, or is this yet another example of the Liberals compromising national security and attacking Alberta for their own political gain? Oh, yeah. yeah. Minister of National Defence. Our government is actually increasing our investments into our Air Force. Canadian Forces Base Coal Lake plays an important role in our NORAD mission and will continue to play a very important role in, in our uh, NORAD uh, mission. In fact, we are actually increasing our investments at CFB Coal Lake, including making important upgrades to our infrastructure. And I'm happy to discuss this matter with my colleague to explain some of the important investments that we are making for his constituents and for the women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. The Honourable Member for Windsor Tecumseh. Mr. Speaker, a U.S. Congressional Commission on China calls the mass internment of hundreds of thousands of Uyghur Muslims in so called re education camps a sweeping program of ethnic cleansing. There's credible evidence of mass arbitrary detention, torture, and mistreatment. Yeah. Will the government call on China to immediately release all those held and conduct an impartial investigation into these abuses? And will Canada apply targeted sanctions against those responsible? The Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, we are deeply concerned by the human rights situation faced by Muslim Uyghurs and other minorities in China. We continue to raise this issue at every opportunity, including in Beijing and at international conferences. We call on the Chinese government to ensure the human rights of its citizens are fully respected. The Prime Minister expressed our concerns with the Chinese Premier last week, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs has also discussed it with China's Foreign Minister at every available opportunity. Mr. Speaker, freedom of religion and freedom of expression must be respected. The Honourable Member for Miramichi, Grand Lake. Mr. Speaker, last Friday we debated C-87, the Poverty Reduction Act. With this legislation, we'll set targets for the lowest level of poverty in Canadian history, establish Canada's official poverty line for the first time, and create a National Poverty Advisory Council that will provide annual reports highlighting our progress in fighting poverty. Could the Minister of Family, Children and Social Development tell the House how the Poverty Reduction Act fits into Canada's first ever National Poverty Reduction strategy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to begin by thanking the member for Miramichi Grand Lake for his hard work in this area. Bill C-87 
$87 is an essential part of our poverty reduction strategy because it shows that to the $22 billion we have spent on anti-poverty programs have lifted thousands of people out of poverty. These investments are part of a long-term plan to support middle-class families and to support all those who were working hard to join the middle class. Mr. Speaker, the Privy Council investigation of cabinet leaks surrounding shipbuilding showed that lobbyists, reporters and dozens of officials were aware of cabinet secrets and liberal attempts to change the contract. Other than senior civil servants and military officers, only two names appear repeatedly in the investigation. The Prime Minister's senior Quebec advisor at the time, Eric Gagné, and CBC reporter James Cudmore. Did Eric Gagné and other officials in the Prime Minister's office hire James Cudmore to silence him? The Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, the, uh, uh, the Honourable Gentleman takes the uh, occasion of uh, questions in question period to uh, lay out certain allegations and insinuations. Uh, the uh, evidence in the, uh, the matter in question will be fully ventilated in a court proceeding, and the courts will determine what evidence is relevant. The courts will determine the facts, and the courts will decide, ultimately. And I note the defendant in the case has said, we have complete confidence in the courts and in their ability to make decisions as to the relevance of the documents. That's Honourable Member for Regina Louvain. Mr. Speaker, Canada's first ministers are meeting this Friday, but the crisis in our energy sector was left off the agenda. The premiers of both Saskatchewan and Alberta have written to the Prime Minister to ask him to change that. Will the Prime Minister add energy market access and the oil price differential to the first minister's agenda? The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague for the question. As he knows, the First Minister's meeting is an opportunity for First Ministers to discuss economic competitiveness, trade diversification. Our government has been very clear for a long time. It's unacceptable that Canadian natural resources are so dependent on one market. We believe diversifying market access is good for the Canadian economy. It's certainly good for Alberta and Albertan workers. And our government will always, always take an opportunity, as we have every single time, to discuss with Alberta and other provinces how we can strengthen the Canadian economy. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, today unions, workers, entrepreneurs and elected members from the Côte-Nord, Bas-Saint-Laurent, Charlevoix and Montérégie, New Brunswick, came together to call on Ottawa to fill the EI black hole. We have solutions. All are calling for protected regions with permanent measures that will take into account the reality of seasonal work in these regions. Even the Conservatives, after having cut the program when they were in government, all of a sudden discovered empathy for workers on the eve of the election. When will this government respect workers and fill in, once and for all, the EI black hole? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question, and I do know, yes, that there is a contrast between this government and the previous government. This government, the first time, for the first time in its 2018 budget, recognized the challenges that workers and families face when it comes to seasonal work. However, the member does know that in budget 2018, we announced a $132 million investment that we will be putting in place along with the provinces and the territories. We look forward to working hard for these families who work so hard to join the middle class. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Bergères. Mr. Speaker, on January 1st, Netflix will start billing the TVQ. The company is cooperating and has said that it will pay taxes where the law requires. In the end, it wasn't that complicated. Now, Quebec also collects the GST for Ottawa, but because the Liberals are the servants of the multinationals, they sent a letter to direct that Netflix not pay the GST, contrary to all the other Quebec businesses. Why are the Liberals so intent on favouring foreign multinationals on the backs of businesses here? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, we've already been very clear on the issue of taxes. You know, we've been working on a very important file. We're working along with the departments, and our colleague knows that we have set up a committee of experts that is reviewing legislation, that is consulting, and we will be tabling legislation 
over the coming years that will be important for future generations with very clear principles. And all those who participate in the system will contribute to the system. There is no free pass.